It's absolutely imperative that we look at the causes of the causes rather than focusing on the individual or on the agents, but we, that we look at structures and our structures of society that include or exclude people. Uh, so it's absolutely imperative and there are several different layers and determinants of health. So interventions can be applied right across education, housing. You know, it means there are so many varied opportunities and also within each of those opportunities, ways for communities right up to policy makers to, um, to shape how things are done. Governments apply interventions and ignore the better ways of working that we've already identified and that is community control and self-determination of this country's first peoples. And that instead, uh, funding should be offered for those people, for our people, to shape those programs and manage them and have the control over not only the programs, but their, their health as well, rather than uh, government in, uh, uh, appointing a commission or appointing a group or developing policies that essentially furthermore exclude Aboriginal people from the very issues that affect their lives. We have a legacy now that's over 200 years old of structures that constantly discriminate against the first peoples of this country who are a minority and uh, time and time again as governments come and go the, uh, the policies are set that are not developed from the ground up and that um, further marginalise Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islanders. So um, there's a lot more scope with research. Um, but the question needs to be asked about, you know, what kind of evidence could we get about racism? You know, it's an incredibly intangible um, topic, you know, that where epidemiological research may not be suitable and... Um, and the other kinds of survey work, whereas we need to be doing more listening to Aboriginal people about how they experience racism and, and have examples that we can take back to governments so that there is something more tangible and that we put a human face to a label that is right across the world, you know, and uh, I think racism is something that we would apply to other minorities and we wouldn't want to own it for our Aboriginal people here. We have um, scant research evidence that suggests post-prison release Aboriginal mort mortality increases within the first month to levels that are unacceptable. So we see people at risk of dying being released from prisons. And that means that when the prison doors are open, our society has on paper, a percentage of these people are now going to be at risk of dying. And we still let them out of prison unsupported. And the little attention that is being paid to the issue is coming from the policy or the research end. And it's not coming from the side to bolster the communities that people are going back to. There's no work being done from our Aboriginal community side to understand the, that there are significant structural barriers that people face immediately post-release from prison and that Aboriginal families are left to help mop up and negotiate. And, uh, and it's an incredibly difficult situation and no wonder we have rates of return to prison that are just so high. since the release of the report and the 360 recommendations made, our prison rate of in Aboriginal people has increased. And in Queensland alone, it's uh, you know, increased far more than what any reasonable citizen of Queensland should consider acceptable. 
and we're in a state where there's more prisons being built. So uh, it's completely at odds with the Royal Commission's recommendations that we need to look at, um, at custody as a last resort and that there are a whole heap of steps before that we really need to, uh, to really consider and bring community into it at various different levels and points along that as well. Uh, you know, because we see our prison population increasing and it's a sad, sad shame on this country that our prison population's increased. And it's actually increasing right at a time where the word is that the US is starting to turn away from such high rates of imprisonment. The US apparently are starting to reconsider the very approaches that we're starting to solidify. So it looks like we've probably got a little bit further on to go, but yeah, we really need to be looking at um, certainly the social determinants of, of prisoner health, uh, one aspect that you know, may provide us with some answers, looking at housing and education and employment and the role that policy and bolstering uh, programs in those areas may have to reduce uh, prison population. So we see that our public health goals and our criminal justice goals are very aligned and could work together to get to the same point. But we need to map this out and we need to be having um, representatives from those departments, government departments, state and federal, you know, to be at the table talking about you know, how things um, you know, can really be bolstered for the future. Thank you.